getting ready to do the beginning of my kickstart demonstration that will focus on color and how it looks quite different simultaneously, a simultaneous color experiment. One of my favorite things to do when I'm teaching new artists to pastels, and even those that have been working in it for a while, and perhaps even an occasional oil painter, is the simultaneous color experiment because it actually goes and crosses over territory to all mediums. It could even be in the same reference to watercolor. But what I've got here are three very different color papers. And I have a white one. Basically a range of values. Not the darkest, but it is sitting on a black. So you can see that there's a color variation there and, and also a value change. What we're going to be doing today is working with a limited color palette of pastels in a variety of hardnesses. We're going to take that like a science experiment. We're going to have some playful experiment. We're going to ask ourselves questions and we're going to explore that limited palette of five or six colors across these four very different value and color surfaces. I'm going to do it step by step and one of the prime things that I love to do is work at the same time across the top of each paper so that you can see exactly how it would look in a different background on a different color. What I've got as my reference here today is a photograph, but I also have a little color study that I had done in pastels down here. And I also have my color wheel because this is also an experiment to help you wrap your mind around the thought of color going on color and how its relationship to that color around it when the color is placed on it. It can look very, very different. And you can use that to your advantage as an artist within your compositions and the stories that you want to tell. So color does take on personalities. And of course, we're working with very rich, beautiful pastels. Um, and if you let your eyes just gaze across the top of a full box of pastels, it just blows you away with the options. And that's why what I wanted to do today is have a selection of limited colors. And I'll show you that in just a minute. What I will be doing is using this little catch tray that will isolate my color palette so that I'll be able to see exactly the limited colors that I have work, working across there. Now this experiment, in terms of if you are an oil painter, you can use it in, in a situation where you would be toning your canvases. Instead of having a white canvas, you might tone it a burnt sienna, and you'd be able to see the simultaneous reaction of color on those two different color surfaces. So why would you want to limit your palette? Well, for the purpose of this experiment, it's very important, but there's other reasons as well. One of the reasons would be that it would make your composition color mood more cohesive. Uh, by not having 150 colors, you create a color harmony. As you can see here, I have a color wheel. So sometimes your decision making can be based on looking at what a complement of a color is. It can be based on the color of the paper you're going to work on, but you can create a color mood by limiting your palette. So over here, I have my little tray of colors that I've already pre-selected. It's a little more than I probably need. However, I might discover as I get going on these that I could use some accent colors, and that's okay. Uh, I'm gonna have fun with this. It's one of my favorite demonstrations to do. I love exploring with color across different surfaces simultaneously, and every time I do it, I learn something new. So the colors that I selected were based on the sky colors. I was trying to get some dynamic dark contrast, some light contrast, and values in between. I was also looking for a mix of hard and soft pastels and things in between. I was looking at uh, my reflections in the water and some landscape colors because there's a little bit of land sticking out there, silhouetted trees that are mostly dark in shadow but with some highlights. Uh, that's how I picked my colors. This is one of my favorite papers to work on, the Cancel Me Tien. What's great about it is that it has two different surfaces. One is very textured and the other side is smooth. 
When I started working in pastels back in the 80s, this is one of the prime papers that was available. And was what I basically did hundreds of, of pastels on. I began to realize that I really enjoyed the smooth side. And in this particular experiment that I'm doing for simultaneous color, uh, one of the sides is textured, but I'm choosing to use two surfaces that are smooth, and this one is more textured. This surface over here is a completely different surface. It is a sanded multimedia artboard made just for pastel. I love this. It's one of my favorite boards to work on. And why I selected it today is because it can be wet. Not only that, but it has texture, far more texture than the Canson papers. But for the purpose of this experiment with color, I wanted to have the colored surfaces. So one of the things that I do is I use a masking tape as a catch tray to put along the bottom of my, my panel so that it doesn't fall onto my floor or a carpet. And this is a great trick that I've been using. So everything's black, I'm using black tape, but you could use regular masking tape. I'm gonna tear this and take the bottom part of it and place it underneath here and fold it in half and bend it downward so that it creates a lip along the edge that I can go ahead and attach a second piece of tape to. <laughs> I won't get that in a minute. And so here's the second piece of tape. I'm gonna do this very slowly so that I don't stick it to itself. But what I wanna do is attach it to this tape very carefully. It takes a little bit of patience, but in the long run, it saves a lot of cleanup. And what happens is all the dust falls down and it catches on the tape. And it's a much easier cleanup. A lot of artists will use a paper tray or just let it fall. And if it falls into your box, you've got quite a mess. You end up having a lot of dusty pastels that you need to clean up later on. So this should work out great. You can see uh, the, the pastel will fall right down there. There we go. I thought I'd share a few tips with you on how I get going. I'm very right-handed and I'm gonna start with my new pastels, which are hard, but I also favor the Jack Richardson hard pastels. So that's what most of these are. The reason why I'm using the hard pastels is because they feel less of the tooth of the paper. The texture of the paper is what holds the pastel. And because these Cancel me tan papers are very smooth. I don't want to fill the tooth of it very quickly. The other thing that I will do is in my opposite hand that I don't use for the pastel, I keep this in my left hand so that I can clean off the pastel if it gets dirty. All right, let's get going. I know that I'm going to be repeating a subject and I'm trying to locate approximately where my horizon line is. You can see right away, as we go across this, that the color looks quite different on each one. This is far more textured. I'm going to throw in where I think the tree is going to be. And I'll have a mountain coming up along there. And of course, over here. Look how very, very different that looks. It's pretty darn exciting. This is a, a wonderful way to explore a subject and see what color surface you think might be the perfect color paper to support your image. I really love working on this soft gray. It's terrific for doing snow scenes. And you might wonder why I selected purple. Well, if you look at the color wheel, purple plays great games as a complement with green. And I know that when I go in through here, I'm gonna be layering green over that. So rather than going straight to the greens of Pennsylvania, I'm looking for something that will complement it and create a sense of um, kind of expressive color energy. Over here, we can see that immediately this dark purple uh, begins to, to just stand out. And I, I'm playing, I, I'm asking myself questions and I'm not worrying too fretfully about making this perfect because pastel does have some forgiveness. If I look over here in my reference of my photo, I see that that tree is relatively um, silhouetted. 
So I'm kind of blocking it in. And I know if I push really hard, this particular purple pastel will create almost a black. And I can actually think about throwing some reflections into the water. If I push really hard over here, if you get a real close look on that, you're gonna see that there's a lot more texture over here than there is here. This is much smoother, completely different. So the flip side of the Canson paper has a very textured surface that is almost like a cheesecloth. And it can work to your advantage or it can go against you. I prefer the smoother surface. Now, why would you want to use the more textured surface? Well, it holds a lot more pastel. So with that in mind, uh, we'll, in this exploration of color, simultaneous color, we're gonna be looking at texture as well and how that supports you. So let's think about, let's do some finger blending. If I wanted to tone this a little bit, I can take my finger and uh, begin to fill in the tooth of the paper and create kind of a mood and an atmosphere. But, uh, you know, if I'm working on a sanded paper, I'm not going to be able to do that. But on this particular Canson paper, doing a little bit of finger blending is very helpful. So I've established my horizon line. Now I'm gonna take my time here and begin to work on the clouds in the sky. Let's take a look at our reference photo again. If we look at the reference photo, I see a pretty large cloud system coming in. There's a, a very strong contrast right here along the horizon line. And there's an additional tree that I didn't throw in. So I can do that. But there's in the sky, there's these rich dynamic dark blues. I, I feel like the thing that I wanna do is focus on these dark blues. So I'm gonna look into my box again. We're gonna go down into my little box that I've pulled out the colors. And I'm gonna look for a really dark blue. I've got a soft dark blue here, but I haven't grabbed a harder pastel dark blue. I might need to grab that, but well, let's see what this looks like. We're not gonna know. So down below here, I haven't actually tested this yet. Let's take that purple that I was using. That's right here. You can see what it looks like down here. This is a really terrific thing to do. If you are experimenting with a new paper or some new pastels, leave an area on your paper where you can test and try things out. The other thing you could do is save scraps of paper or maybe the flip side of a piece of paper so that you can test things. So that's what that purple looks like. Let's see what the blue looks like on here. It's very dark, dark blue. And over here on the gray. So that, that blue really stands out over here on the orange. And I found in landscapes, the, the orange color is actually a really wonderful complement to the greens of Pennsylvania. And it also works well for skies. But let's test this out here. Here we go. I'm gonna to begin to block in the blues of where the sky would be. And I'm not gonna worry about making a perfect sky. I'm just gonna to try to move across this blend that a little bit. Might even take a little bit of this blue over the mountain. And I know I can go back in and add that later on if I want to, if I want to add greens in. Let's see what happens when we go up in here. It's just really fun. All right, so to create some atmosphere, I might want to do a little bit of blending with my finger. But once I get some pastel on here, my goal will be to take the pastel over top of a pastel and do the blending by the pastel going over the pastel. I can push really hard to create a nice dark blue if I want, or I can glide it very softly and just create a halo. I'm gonna think about reflections in the water because this is the water down below. Throwing some of the blue in there just a little bit to create a color harmony. I'm gonna move on to another blue color. Go back into my box. I'm gonna grab this blue right here. It's definitely a lighter blue, but it's still relatively dark. I'm gonna float it over top of this one. 
And this is the textured surface. And here's a smoother one, but it still has some texture. And I'm gonna begin to take my finger and lose some of this orange in here so that it begins to create an atmosphere of my cloud. And I'm working back and forth between the three of these because this is an opportunity to see how a single color can look quite different. And if you think about it, it's almost like you're being a scientist. You're gathering information. We're not worried about making a perfect painting. We're trying different things. And even though this is a relatively smooth paper and not a sanded one, the Kinson paper has the ability and attribute to actually hold a decent amount of pigment. I'm beginning to play around with the reflections. I love to move back and forth between the foreground, the background, and the atmosphere. So I'm at a point where I want to step back and take a look at what I've done. My goal was to begin to block in here. I'm going to step back, review what I've done. I, I have my horizon line established. I've got my areas down here where I'm, I'm testing my colors. And uh, it's kind of, it's pretty exciting to see how different single colors look on three different color papers. Haven't even touched this one yet, but we're gonna save that for a few minutes. So my next step in this process here is to begin to put in some of the lighter colors, maybe some of the whites of the sky. Let's see what we can do. All right, got some blues. Maybe I'll add a few more blues and lighter colors. Let's see what will happen. So I'm going to begin to float colors over top of colors. I want to see what this looks like. Begin to merge these. My goal is not to make a, uh, a perfect replica of that photograph. I'm just using it as inspiration. And of course, we're, we're taking a look at how these colors look across in the different positions. So instead of going straight to the whites, I'm, I'm grabbing some other lighter blues, kind of leaning towards the ceruleans, whereas the colors that I had in there before were more ultramarine. So paying attention to that. And I really think what I want to do is really establish these rich darks and just keep moving back and forth between the lights and the darks. It takes a little bit of time. And notice that I'm wiping the pastels as I work along here. I think I do need to get some of my lighter colors. Now this is not white, it's a light blue. This is an older pastel and it is a Grumbacher. I have very few of those, but it does a different kind of thing. It doesn't Fill the tooth as much and it looks like a white but it's not white so this is a big Jack Richardson white let me show you there's white and this color is more of a bluish gray I'm gonna try to really get my top of my mountain to be established so that we can see a variety of things. Okay, step back again and see what that looks like. So what I'm trying to do is establish a stronger contrast so we can see where the mountain begins and the sky comes in. And I'm, I'm glancing every once in a while over there. But I'm also trying to work across 
these different images. It's kind of a precarious angle. I can't quite see all the way across here, but I think it's going to work. So notice whenever I take this harder pastel over some of the softer colors, I can actually do some blending of the pastel that's already down just by sliding this over top of it. There's no finger blending going on. It's just pastel going over top of pastel. I'll throw a little bit of reflection down into the water. And just work my way across all of these. I'm just playing. I, I'm actually discovering a lot of things. Go ahead and throw some other blues up in here. And then glide the lighter blue over top of it and blend it. Remember, this is the more textured paper over here. And if I push harder, I'll get a darker, more intense pigment. If I float it gently, I can use this to blend the cloud. So this is the more textured paper, so that the tooth and the texture that might need some blending to fill in the little spots that are not catching the pigment. And it's, it's very fun to see the reaction of these colors across the three different color papers. to begin to get more of a silhouette of this tree. I did block them in in purple, so now I'm going to turn to some greens and begin to put some of the natural colors in there. And I can push harder or lighter, and I can merge the purples, and I can even leave some of the pops of the orange showing through if I want to. But again, I want to keep going across here, grab a slightly darker green, and work my way across and establish the edge of the water on the shoreline. And I'm just keep working across my paper so you can actually see the difference of these different color papers and what happens. There is some forgiveness, as in you'll be able to change some things, but once you lose the color of the paper underneath, it's, uh, you know, for example, if I fill that all in there, I'm never really going to be able to get back to the orange of the paper. So if you lose a color that you might want to keep from the under part of that, in, in order to get it back again with this particular paper, which is very delicate, you're going to need to go into your box and match the color of the paper. So with that in mind, what I usually do, if I'm trying to incorporate the color of my paper into the composition and the final look of it, I creep up on removing and making the color go away. I allow some of the paper color to just continue showing until the very end, and then I make these conscious choices. But again, I'm playing, and this is an experiment that I'm doing in front of you so you can see how I do this. Now look at my reference photo again. I notice that this is much darker along here, and there's actually a second tree popping up, so notice that I can actually put the, uh, the dark color over top of the light, which is an interesting thing. You might not think you can put a dark over a light, but you can. And these harder pastels enable that possibility. So this takes a little bit of work, but um, I'm having some fun. I'm going to go over here. And you might wonder, well, again, why would I put the purple down and now put the green over top of it? Well, it makes for a, a, a more exciting painting. It creates color vibration. I 
So when I do these in my classes for my students, I, I call them a kickstart demonstration because my goal is to create a visual inspiration, uh, take you on a journey of how an artist is thinking and how they begin to develop things. And with that in mind, I'm hoping that you can personally connect in some way, whether it be with a new color use or perhaps uh, option of a paper that you might never have thought of trying before. And by working back and forth across these three different papers, um, you're getting a chance to see how very different they look. So, so far I've been using a lot of the harder pastels to do this tree. And notice how I continue to work around the painting. And rather than finishing one area and then moving on to the sky, I'm sort of circling the composition. I, uh, I began with the horizon, worked into the sky, tossed some things in the reflections, I'm gonna pull back again. All right, now it might be distracting to have this down here, but if you cover that up and you really focus on the composition, it's starting to come together. So that's my goal. Um, all right, now, what I want to do is look at the negative space around the tree. Now that's a pretty white white. I think I'm going to go back to this blue that I was using because it's a little too stark. I can always put the light over top of it, but I want to establish a distinct variation of where the tree begins and ends and try to do that across all of these. actually see where the tree is and begin to get a sense of space the sky behind and the tree in the foreground here. Do that thing under. Just step back again and look at this. So I'm working with the harder pastel so that I don't fill the tooth of the paper in. Let's see what happens if we go to a softer pastel in a similar color. I'm gonna look into my box, see if I can find, here is this pastel. Let's put it on the white. That's what it looks like there. And this is a much creamier, softer one. It's a Jack Richardson, very similar, but it's a little cooler. But I think that would work. So it's nice to have a variation of uh, soft and hard. into the richer, darker blues again. I think this softer one works better. Yeah, that's definitely dark. Coming down into there. And I'm gonna to have to keep stepping back because I can't see all of these and there's a glare on the photo. It'd be better to have it here. But for now, we'll just keep working. All right, so I'm cleaning my pastel off. Look on the edge of this, throwing some blues in. I think we have decided to block the tree in here. Yeah, I'm gonna take a break and step back again and see where we are. Because we know that when we're standing right in front of something, we really can't see the big picture. So I'm gonna step myself back and take a peek. Right. Yeah. Across here. All right. It's feeling like this dark blue is what's really helping get the dimension going on. So 
So I decided to move my, my reference photo because it was really too far to the side for me to get any visual clarity on it on this angle. So I think this is going to, to support me. So, you know, something really interesting to think about is when you're setting up your stations to paint reference photos, having everything kind of ergonomically where you need it, kind of nesting, you know, getting it comfortable for yourself so that you don't have a lot of distractions and stopping. Uh, of course, not everybody's going to be videotaping what they're doing, I think. but I think that's going to help me and make me relax a little bit more so that I can really focus. Now I can see what's going on in this. I'm still keep working back and forth between the two images. I'm going to vary my pressure and I can do some blending up in here and perhaps a little bit of finger blending. You can do that on here. I'm not going to be able to do that on that one because the sandpaper would cut my hand. Yeah, there we go. That's much better. So the position's definitely helping me, having this closer spot and I'm incorporating some of the blue that's in the sky actually into the mountain and down into the water. Look at reflections from this tree coming up there. Uh, slowly but surely developing into Three different landscapes. Same subject inspiration, but um, slightly different papers, causing some subtle reactions. And perhaps by the time we finish up here, we're going to decide that we like one color better than another one. I know for me, I often really enjoy this pop of the orange um, paper for landscapes. It really creates an interesting atmosphere. This is a lighter green by the Jack Richardson. I'm pushing my colors a little bit from what is actually in the photo, but I think it'll make it a little more interesting. Once in a while, I'll just go back up into the sky. But slowly but surely, the image begins to emerge. Of course, I'm working on three different paintings at the same time. So that means that uh, it takes a little while to get things going. Almost time to start popping the whites in, but not quite yet. I'll look at the negative space within the tree to let some of the sky show through. And I'm trying to remember to have some fun with this because. Definitely an inspirational image. Very dynamic with the sky and the drama in there. Well, let's try to creep up on some brighter lights and see what happens. Whenever I take this soft pastel over the blue, it actually blends it. Let's try that. So I actually can get three very different things uh, with a single color here. I'll continue to roll my paper towel so I can clean this off. But I can take this very light color and blend it over the blues and begin to create a, a feeling of a cloud. I can blend it up in here too. So when I do these in my classes, I usually work very quickly and within 20 minutes, 
I might cover the entire surface of all these papers. But the idea is just to do a, a kickstart. Now, so that everyone's inspired and then they want to work in the class. But now that I'm working with a Zoom situation and teaching, I've decided to do some longer pre-recorded videos so that students can look and think about this on their own. You can stop and start it when they want to. You pull back again. And so while I'm mentioning the idea of pulling back, I like working standing up. And those of you that prefer sitting when you're painting, you need to remember to every once in a while stand up and step back. It's very important to do that uh, so you get a really big picture on things. So I think that I have a decent amount uh, blocked in here. And what I want to do on this is take a little segue and go in here and block in similar colors. But because my intentions will be to wet this and dissolve this, uh, I'm not going to use too many colors. Let's go ahead and grab the blues. I'm gonna test them. It's kind of a soft gray blue. And the dark blue that I've been using here is this color. So you see how very dark it looks on, on the white. It's really dynamic. I'm gonna be able to stand over this way and I'm going to take my dark green. I think this is what that is. Of a dark green. I'm going to establish my horizon line where the mountain's going to be. But remember, I used the purples. So I'm going to go ahead and grab the purple. And block this in faintly with a little bit of reflection in the water. worry about it being perfect. Okay, I'm going to take the dark blue and establish where some of the dark blue cloud is. And I think I'm going to throw an interesting color in here. too much of that in there. All right, we're going to take a break. I'm going to get some water and I'll show you how I, I block that in. So I pulled out two of Jack Richardson's signature hog bristle brushes. The hog bristle is very durable. And these are filberts. They come to a point and I keep these only for my pastels. I try very hard not to mix up my oil brushes with my pastel brushes because this is water soluble. Now I'm not using alcohol. Some people use alcohol, but I'm using water today. And if you wanted it to dry faster, the alcohol could work, but we're just gonna keep it really simple. So I have these two brushes. One of this is a number four and the other is an eight. And the first thing I'm going to do is use my water. And I just grabbed a good old yummy treat. Just gonna dip it in there. And I'm going to use the smaller one to dissolve the darker colors. I'm gonna roll this brush. I'm gonna let it just be kind of one with the tree and allow this beautiful purple to you know, create some interesting uh, variations on the color. Now, of course, just like watercolor, when watercolor is wet, it's darker and as it dries, it's lighter. But this will give me a nice foundation to put my other pastels on. And notice, although these are hard pastels that I'm using, there's a lot of pigment in this, and it's very rich. This is from the Jack Richardson hard pastels. Notice I'm not just going back and forth like that. I'm creating a sense of topography. I'm one with the mountain, one with the tree. I'm creating feeling of 
what it might look like, maybe dragging the pigment around and uh, creating a sense of a foreground area with trees. And there's a little bit of green down here, but that's mostly the purples. So I'm gonna stop with that. Now that was this brush. And I picked a smaller one because I knew I wanted to uh, be able to get the sense of the trees. All right, I'll lay that down. Now I'm gonna grab the larger brush. And this one, the first thing I'm going to do is dissolve the lighter colors. Now, I know it might seem kind of bizarre that I threw this peachy color in there, but I know that I'll be covering up a lot of it. And this is where the water reflections are. So I'm gonna to try to create kind of Z-like movements and uh, I can go back and build other colors on top of it later. Rinse that out a little bit. I'm just gonna take this blush of a color where the lighter colors would be and just, uh, just drag it around a little bit. Wet it a little more. Now I'm going to try to make it feel like a, a cloud. And notice, now here's the, the uh, softer pastel. I can pull it around to echo some of the sense of what's happening down in the cloud there. And I know that I'll be able to build other colors on top of it. So I'm not worried about perfection. I can even maybe pull some of this blue back through here. And there we go. And even drag a little bit. Notice how there's a like, pigment rich in the brush. You can take it and drag it through here and create a little more of an atmosphere. Voila. Okay, so I'm gonna let that dry and I'm gonna put the brushes away. I will not be using these anymore. That will dry and set up. It was simply meant to create an atmosphere for which me to apply pastel on top of it. So let's take a look at these. We've got three very different color papers going on plus white. And you can begin to see different kinds of things happening. Although this is a really smooth surface, it's possible to get many, many layers on top of it. It's pretty loose and wild right now, uh, but we have a sense of the space. We have the foreground, we have the middle ground, and the distant sky. And I can begin to continue working on top of these. While I work across these and get more detail into it, I can decide whether or not I want to allow any of this warm color to show through. Um, and I think in terms of these two pieces here, this one I'm, I'm going to develop more and probably lose most of the color of the paper. Whereas this one, I might consciously try to see some of those pops of those oranges coming through to see if I can create a slightly different atmosphere in it. This one over here is the textured paper. If you come in really close, I don't know how close you can see the kind of cheesecloth texture that's going on there. I find that slightly distracting. So when would you want to use the textured side of the Canson paper? Perhaps if you had a, a textured feel or something like that. But if you're going to do a glass bottle or something very smooth, you're probably going to find that that's going to be distracting. Now I've been teaching pastels since the early 80s and more recently I've been doing these quick two-hour classes at a local um, art gallery store called Art a la Carte and I was working with students who'd never used pastels before and some of them wanted to use the textured side but nine out of ten times they all say to me, oh I like the smoother side better. So I'm going to just basically say to you Go ahead and use the smoother side, but definitely try this in this test. Now, in terms of this piece over here, this is still very wet. I can, I can feel the dampness of that paper, and I probably won't be working in pastel on that until that's thoroughly dry. But let's just say, I wonder what would happen if I actually worked on it while it was still wet. Well, you probably don't want to take one of your expensive soft pastels. 
but you might want to try one of the harder pastels. So I've got my Jack Richardson dark green and my purple, the two colors that I had been using here. Let's see what happens if we go into the wet area. Uh, it actually, it, it increases the value, makes it uh, a different kind of thing is happening. So you might want to play around with that and see if it's to your advantage, if it helps. But generally, I wait till it's completely dry. I'm going to take a break. I'm going to step back again, and I'll be back in a few minutes to finish these up. So I'm going to get going on this. My goal will be to continue to work across each of the surfaces, and as I work, I'll explain what I'm doing, and I think you're going to discover a lot of things. And my goal is for you to get into a thought provoking situation where you're asking yourself questions and wondering how you're going to connect this to your own personal artwork. All right, let's get going. So what I'm looking at now are the negative spaces between the area behind the tree and basically the silhouette of what you would see and then the sky holes behind the tree. I'm gonna step back after that little session and this is a, a good thing to do. So it's kind of exciting. We've been in the midst of a drought here and I hear a thunderstorm coming in. So it'll be interesting to see if our power goes out, but I'm going to have some fun. I've been reconnecting with my pieces and I think where I want to start is right over here on the multimedia artboard because that is the piece that I last uh, worked on and it's completely dry now. If you remember, I, I dissolved it with a brush and water. Now it's completely dry. So I'm looking at my photo and I see that I can add different blues. So I think I'm going to grab some of these more cerulean type blues and begin to float them over top to make real simple uh, color variations. Uh, just have fun with it. Uh, this is a sanded paper, but it's not too rough, so I can touch it a little bit if I need to. One of the things I like to do is vary the pressure of my pastel. I'm going very lightly, just floating it over top of some of this blue. And this is not too rough, so I can do a little bit of blending, but I try to unify a piece by using the same color in different places, in the background in the sky and the, into the area where the tree will be silhouetted, and weaving it through the entire painting. I can go back over this with many, many layers, and the blue will help unify it in a certain degree. I think I'll just throw a little in the water. And now I'm going to change up. And before I put my pastel down, what I do is I wipe it on here to clean it off. I'm keeping the ones that I'm pretty active with right here. Let's see, I think I would like to go to the dark greens. 
So this is very dark in value. And I'm going to begin to integrate and create some big shapes in these trees and float it over top of the purple, not totally obscuring it, but allowing it to become incorporated in. And I don't have to follow the photo like a map. I can make my uh, artistic decisions to leave parts of things out and keep them. Now I just got a, green, a little bit of green up in the sky, but I think I can go back and I'll be able to take some white over top of that. Now I'm looking at my photo and I see that there's actually quite a lot of darkness in here. It makes me want to go back and grab the purple again and perhaps reflect that into the water. Just keep building very thin layers and think about how reflections are often like a Z uh, and it makes it feel more like water whereas up here my mark making can be more uh, tree like so, uh, so I've got two colors right now that I'm playing with and I seem to be relying quite a lot on my Richardson hard pastels so here we go I'm in one of those beginning layers um, going back and forth between the greens. I will be adding some other greens in to float them over top of it. And back and forth between the purple, so I'm holding them in my left hand and grabbing and intermixing. Thinking about how the tree would be reflected in the water and trying to create some larger shapes. I really love to lock in my bottoms. I almost feel like I need, need to dissolve this with a little bit of water to make it more fluid and you know I may end up doing that. But here's the key to making something fluid. If I have too many colors here and I, I wet them, what's going to happen is they will merge together and become dissolved pigments that um, you know could get very muddy. So that's where you have to be sort of careful. If you remember, when I began this piece on the multimedia artboard, I started it out with a couple of brushes and I began with the lighter colors, not the darker ones. But that would be a concern. If I go back into this, I could break it down and uh, ruin it. So I'm not quite ready to do that, but I'm considering it. I'm looking back up into the sky, and I want to work some blues up into here. It's not quite the exact same blue that I have here, this really dark one. It's a value um, lighter. So if I push really hard, I can actually fill the whole tooth that paper. For example, down here, when I push hard, it makes that color. But if I float it across, you can see that it gets uh, kind of a gradation. And I think that's one of the really key things that you get to discover when you're doing this experiment, is the, the value of understanding the pressure that you put on your pastel as you're gliding it across the paper. It really makes a difference. Taking some of this blue and throwing it into the water. I'm going to soften the lightness along there. I don't even need to put a pastel on. I could just kind of drive it into the edge. Uh, I want a really intense contrast. I can push harder. Now, some of you might be wondering, I think I wish I could that light. Give me a second here. Um, yeah, I want to bring that lightness back. Some of you might be wondering what is the brand of pastel that I'm using. Uh, these two pastels, I just grabbed a, uh, a white Richardson hand rolled soft and a blue. Not sure of the numbers or the names, but that's what I'm playing around with. So let's take 
taking on definitely a personality. Uh, and I can go back in with the white and begin to accentuate the edges of some of the clouds that I want. I can also begin to So we'll let the edge of the mountain a little more clearly and the tree. But that's not quite the color that I want. I think it's too cold and too white. I'm going to try this one here. It's not quite white. It's a warmer color. Yeah, that's bright. That can work. So um, when you're working with clouds, you want to think about variations of white, not just white light. You might want to think about warmer whites, which is what this one is. It's a little bit of peach in it. So this is really fun. I could uh, play with this for hours, uh, defining things. Each one of these can be just this lovely little story. And I have the ability to go back and forth with blues over top of these if I want to. And I can use the pastel to kind of blend it. So when I do these in my class, it's usually really sped up and quick. I thought I would take my time here and be more thoughtful. Um, so I can go back and forth with different colors. And you, you, know, you kind of have to change it up. was so soft it just crumbled. Um, I think I want to work with subtleties of warmer colors in there. And, um, go back and forth between the, the actual tree. to silhouette this other little tree that's in here but yeah it'll take a little more thoughtful working and then this hillside has kind of this yellowy green and a little bit along here and this is a uh, a coarser big chunk Actually, Richardson makes it these big squares. I'll show this to you another time. But this is a gold color that I just really love. Um, so I probably need to work a little bit of that into here. And I can even take my purple and go back over it again if I need to. For the greens. So I'm not following my photo exactly, but it's definitely adding um, thoughtful inspiration and, a, and a sort of a guided map on how to do this. I'll have to stop and pick up a few things. I'm adding a, a much brighter color. This one right here, it's a hard, Jack Richardson hard. I'm gonna take a little break and collect the pastels that I've been dropping on the floor.
before I step on them. The next three papers that are to the left of the multimedia artboard are very different. They cannot be wet. These papers have a smooth side and a soft side, and they're called Quinçon Mitien. I know Michaels carries them, and this was from a 9 by 12 uh, packet that has maybe 50 sheets in it of different colors. So this is a gray, this is an orange, and that is a soft, warm, lighter gray. This one is the one side that I, I put up that's textured. So as I work across these three in the final part of my lesson, we're going to be looking at textures and we're going to be seriously thinking about how color and texture affect the mark making that we use with the limited palette. I'm going to just touch up a couple things here with a white then I know I'm going to drag across into this image that's on the, the coarser multimedia. Well, this is multimedia and this is Kansan. So this is the coarser side of the Kansan, which has two sides you can work on. So this white pastel can be very light or I can push it and make it very hard where it almost crumbles. I can use this to my advantage in a cloud. I can actually do some mixing and blending and create that type of cloud that's up there and hit highlights over here on some other areas and begin to define the silhouette of this uh, backlit tree. This is locally where I kayak in. Oh, here comes the thunder. Ooh, the thunderstorm has arrived. I don't know if you can hear that, but I can. <laughs> So this is really enjoyable. I, I love working across, across all these different types of papers and discovering little things that work and asking myself questions. Um, you know, why is this working better for me? What is it about a surface that I like? I'll switch it up here. And go to the green. Oh, I jumped over to this one. So you have to realize that I've done this demonstration probably 40 times. And what I intuitively do whenever I'm working in front of a class is work from left to right doing the first three cansan, and then I do the, the wet underpainting on the multimedia artboard. And then I reverse it while well, that's dry, then I work on that. And then I work across this way. So what I'm going to be doing here in the final session is working across all three of the Canson papers. This is textured, it's gray, this is orange, and it's smooth, that's smooth as well. And that way I can just be a, kind of a free spirit with my painting and, uh, and you can all just follow along with me. I'm varying pressure blocking in the edge of the shoreline looking at the photo. I can even just scoot over here and try it out simultaneously with this other paper that's the textured side. <laughs> and if I allow some of the color and paper to show through, <laughs> get all the thunder and lightning, uh, I can pretty much just make this into uh, greens and the purples. You can probably see now how I could do this very quickly within a class session, just blocking in, working really quickly. back over here. And grab a couple. Oh my goodness. This is where it starts to get fun. Maybe I'll pull this yellow in. It's a little warmer than what I thought it would be, so I'll go to this one. And that's lighter than what I wanted. Hmm. So that's the thing with pastels. You just don't know what the color is going to look like until you put it onto the paper and you see the relationship of the other colors. 
next to it. But I know I can make many layers and I can go back and there's forgiveness for things that I might want to change. So that you can see this is a purple color if I really push it down hard. So this is going to let me really build rescue car going by. I do live in a town. Uh, it's the town of Belfont, and I'm on a very busy street, but I have a double backyard with a beautiful garden. I'll share that with you sometime. As a matter of fact, my next demonstration is going to deal with my purple cone flowers from my garden. Let's go across over here. Thanks for joining me for another Kickstart demo from my Pastel Studio. We'll see you next time.